what we were, yeah, when I hit recording too. Oh. John, looks like you've already got the recording going, so thanks for that. And I'm just gonna bring up the meeting here real quick, go over the kind of what we put together I got for questions. And then uh, share screen, I wanna go ahead and share my full screen. I'm expecting people are able to see the screen right now, correct? Yeah. Awesome, awesome. So I uh, know some of the questions that we have for sure were on upgrading. So how to upgrade between major versions, such as a four dot version of FPP to a five dot X version. And uh, we'll use the FPP OS method. We're gonna talk a little bit about setting up FPP as a controller and the correct properties that you're gonna to wanna to define in X sites on the controller tab. Um, didn't go over that a lot at the mini, but we uh, had one um, K40 that Dave used for his moving heads. Um, but I've got a K8 here on the board that we'll be using as well. Um, we're gonna just quickly review over FPP Connect from X sites and how to configure and push configurations and sequences to FPP through the FPP Connect. We did demonstrate that, but we'll go through it again here real quick. because so we'll do a, another quick sequence. We'll do the infamous butterfly on all, just to get some flashy blinky going. And then uh, we're gonna discuss uh, the player and remote mode or multi-sync. That's where multiple FPP devices can communicate with each other using just a time sync packet instead of actually sending the entirety of the show data network over the network. So that's very efficient, especially if you're trying to do any wireless on your show. Um, it used to be referred to as like master remote, but there is no master model anymore in 5.x. So it's just called player and remote. And then uh, to kind of wrap up, we'll kind of go over the separate show network network design model using proxy mode. There's a lot of... Um, a lot of documentation out there about how to set up separate show network. A lot of people have like walkthroughs, right? A lot of walkthroughs you run into. It is usually not necessary to have a separate show network. Um, in fact, in 98% of the shows, it's absolutely not necessary, but it's okay. So we figured we'd go ahead and talk through it. Um, so in case you did want to have a separate show network, you can see kind of how to best make that happen. Anyone else in the room here that's uh, joined us tonight have any other questions or anything or anything we want to make sure and cover tonight before um, we just start jumping in? Feel free to use the chat method for posting chat. I'm sure John will kind of keep an eye on that as well. I'll try as also. But uh, if you do have any kind of questions, don't hesitate to just uh, come off mute and feel free to speak out. Stop me at any time if I'm going too quick. And um, if you wanted to cover something a little bit more, right? I'm going to get rid of this. Actually, my Zoom other icons in the way. I was going to have that available in Notepad, but I wasn't very quick on getting that there. So I just figured I'd go through this right here on the posting. Awesome. So uh, I guess we'll get right into it. So I'm going to go ahead and um, minimize my video and everything there. Just kind of quick view review of what we had for layout. So on the, the layout, we had a handful of props set up there in the room. A mother of all wreaths over here on the left, a couple candy canes, had a singing bowl, a uh, custom white snowflake, and then the um, showstopper flake. So this is still kind of set up the same way we had set up um, at the mini. Um, a couple of notable um, differences are the controllers. So at the mini, we had these top set of props ran by a um, Falcon F-48. And then we had the uh, showstopper ran off of a Falcon um, F-16 V-3. Uh, that was Vinny's controller for the top and Mike Soffergan's controller for the showstopper flake. I don't have those controllers, so I've swapped out the controllers that we're going to be using to kind of finish this up, but it's still pretty much representative. So... The controllers that we um, are using today are the Culp K8B. And this is what we have the top prop set to the same way we had in the class. So the rosary spans three ports. There's 200, 200, and 286 pixels. We had the chroma cane canes on um, port four. We had the snowflake on five and the chroma bulb on six. 
So the visualizer looks pretty much the same. It's just a different controller. Not a big deal. And then uh, the showstopper flakes over on the F-16. I have an F-16 V4 here on my bench. So uh, we put the um, showstopper flake, but in my case, I have it um, plugged into port. I'm using port 15 on this um, guy. So I just had the showstopper snowflakes band 14, 15, 16. On my test bench, I've only got, um, I've got three, um, excuse me, just two right now, um, 50 count strings. Let me go back to my video. I'm gonna unblur my background for a moment. So I got a test bed in the back here. Um, I've got the networking board that I had at the mini with all of the networking setup and my K8 and a couple of receivers and stuff on it, the 16 extra. So I just got some pixel strings running around the table here that'll represent the um, F16 um, Showstopper Snowflake and the uh, GE MOA on uh, the Colt. So we got the Colt on port one and the um, port 15 on the F16 is what's currently lit and, and live here right now. So move this back and I'm way off center now. I look on my screen, my video looks like it's way off, but whatever. Um, Am I way off center to everybody else in the video? Or is it just me? Look good on this end. Yeah, you're pretty much centered. I mean, maybe just a tiny bit. I went I'm, too far. I'm, I'm went too far to the left. Yeah, I'm like uh, right there, centered. Yeah, it's split right on my nose in my view, which is kind of just weird. But I'm not really watching my camera view anyway. All right, so that's the quick rundown and kind of what we've got configured and set up. Um, tools and FPP Connect, just so we can discover the um, Pi Player because it's not defined as a controller. So this is the same Pi Player. It's Pi Four. I did down rev it to 461, just so we can go through the actual um, major version upgrade um, live while we're here. So that's a 192.68.30.69, and the um, Culp is a 30.97, um, and the Falcon's 30.65. You can see here in the background over on the controller page. So on the on the networking side of things, mm -hmm. that 30, you should have like since everything on your home network is on the zero typically. Um, should you have your whole show on like a different number, like 30 you have? Do you follow what I'm saying? Um not always, right? So uh I'm gonna bring in my presentation again to get those same um Um, I'm pretty sure everybody knows what Raspberry, this is Raspberry Pi Zero up here in this top. Uh, this is a Pi Four, Beagle Bone Black, and a Pocket Beagle. Just you know, filling that in, right? And um, we've kind of been through all that. But so the common network I'm set up right now is basically like a wired on home network with a switch. So this is defined in the FPP manual, um, starting around page 180, I think. It's kind of towards the end of the manual. They have different networking setups. So in the example of what we built for the, the classroom, like dot 30 would be your home network. But if dot zero is your home network, 192.168.0, this is a typical model where you would have a network switch that you would have your FPP and your controllers plugged into all on the same IP subnet, like 0 0.1, or your zero, like this case has a controller at 0 0.101, another controller is 0 0.102, the Raspberry Pi with FPP is 0 0.100. And then your home network is still 0 dot whatever, right? So your home computer be your Excite's computer. It could be wireless or wired. But if you put a switch in and connect to your home network and then just attach all your show controllers to that switch, this is the most simple, straightforward, and a highly functioning network setup. Remember when we chatted on Saturday, you know, a network engineer long ago had told me once to be the packet, right? Follow the data flow. When FPP plays the show, 
the data is going to leave FPP, go through the switch to your controllers. Right? So all of your show data would stay right within this switch and not really go to the rest of your home router and everything else. So this is perfectly acceptable. And in fact, I would argue a preferred networking setup. Right? Does that kind of answer your question? I think that was Tim. Yes, it did. Sorry, yes. my son was talking to me too. So. Yeah, no problem. So the next most common network setup we see is called a separate show network. And we'll kind of get into this um, at the tail end of tonight, which basically looks almost the same, except you have FPP device wirelessly connected to your home network. And this guy will function as kind of like a gateway device to bridge the two networks from your home network to your controller network. Um, in this case, if you look at FPP, you can see like the WLAN zero, that would be the wireless interface would be on a zero, 192.168.0.100 still. And that would be wireless to your home network. And then the ethernet interface would be configured for 100.2. And then that would go to the show network. So then your controllers would also have to be like a 100.3 and a 100.4 or whatever. Now in the Zoom room, we frequently set that up just like one IP different. So it can be any network that's available we commonly do if your home is 192.168.0 we likely would set up the show network if you needed a show network we likely would set that up as a um, 192.168.1 these images in my presentation are straight out of the fpp manual so they're all there in the fpp manual um one advantage of this method is if, example, you had everything out in the yard and you had your FPP device in a controller box with your controllers all out in the yard and you didn't have the ability to get a network cable strung from in the house out to the FPP device, this would allow you to have wireless control from your Xlite's computer to the FPP, but yet all of the show network would still go through the switch and, and um, and be out in the yard. All the show data would still be out there in the yard. So there is one advantage of doing this separate show network is to kind of have that wireless separation from the home network. Does that kind of probably explain that second networking style? I just had an aha moment. Yeah, an aha moment, yeah, yeah. And of course, if you do get somewhere and you get kind of stuck, we do have the, you know, the x -Lite Zoom room is always available is a great place to come. Ask your questions, raise your hand. I know Tim's in there regularly. In fact, last night when I was in there, he was in there. And, uh, you know, feel free to come into the x -Lite Zoom room through xlights.org. Click the blue button and that room goes 24-7 pretty much, right? So uh, what we got through on Saturday was we wrote the image of the card, did initial setup. We talked a little bit about how to navigate around the interface. We did the basic update, kind of a quick um, Xlite's controller config, but we're going to hit that a little bit harder tonight. And then the FEP Connect utility, we talked a little bit about to send sequences, and we'll talk more of that detail. And then um, create a playlist and set up a schedule, right? Um, display testing, we'll talk a little bit about that tonight too, if you like. I'm happy to stay on as long as need be, but let's get through the primary content that people are asking about first, I think. So um, major upgrade. So here's the um, the Pi 4 up in the upper right corner. You want to see the little Raspberry Pi logo, Pi 4. There's a Pi 4. This is running 461. That's the last stable, that's the last version available in the X in the 4.x version line. Um, before we went to 5.x earlier in the year. Um, that's when we had the major interface change, right? Um, the menuing system is still pretty much the same. You have status and control to get you to the status page and network. We'll talk a bit about the multi-sync when we get to um, player remote mode. Content setup, file manager for all your um, sequences and audio files, playlist for build and playlist and scheduler, and input and output is all your channel inputs and outputs that you would have to define. That This gets configured from X lights, so you don't have to spend much time in there. Um, and then the help button is always uh, critical, right? This always have a link straight to the FPP manual. Uh, there's some troubleshooting commands that give information about your system. You might get asked for that if you're in the Zoom room. Um, and then the help 
about page. So there's two ways to get, that's where we do our upgrades. We go to help and about. There's two ways to get to this page through the help menu and then about. We'll take you to the help about page. Um, and also wherever you have the version number here in 4.6, it's highlighted right here under the center. If you click this version number, that takes you straight to the same help about page. Go back to the status page, click the version, takes you right back to the same page. This is help and about. How do you know if an update's available? The key thing is that you're gonna see this local Git version. This is gonna be basically the version currently running on this instance. And then you'll see a remote Git version. And if these are the same, then that's the most current version available. So if I were to look at this right now, you say this is the most current version available. If I hit upgrade right now, I didn't really mean to hit that button, by the way. Dang it, I'm always doing that, but okay. It will just go through and reapply the same version. It doesn't actually do an upgrade, but this is what we saw on 5.x when we just click in 5.x, it's a green button. In 4.x, it's gray. Um, that's will just go through the minor update. This is not how you do the big update, right? Uh, this is finishing up now, so it just it's done. Um, you notice it didn't really change. It's still V four six one. That is a good note. If you do hit the upgrade button, it just reapplies the same version over again, right? Um, no big deal. Um, you normally will not see this upgrade OS option, right? This upgrade OS option will only show up if you download the file I'm getting ready to talk about. So, so if you recall from Saturday or any other time, where do we find the FPP software, right? It's in GitHub. So if we go to Chrome and just, you know, one way just, or any browser, doesn't matter, GitHub space FPP and hit enter. And you do a search right here, you'll see this Falcon Christmas FPP at Falcon player, right? Um, this will take you right to the main page of the project. You might see a page like this with all this code and stuff like what the heck well over here on the far right is where the releases are you can see all the different releases you can either click the blue link down here at the bottom or up here at the top click releases and that'll take you to the actual releases that are signed and delivered right and so 5.5 is what we're going to be going to you can look down and uh, read about any bug fixes any enhancements and stuff, installation instructions, we already know all that. And then to the assets, which may be collapsed and may be expanded, these are all the files you download. Remember the FPP is available for both Raspberry Pi as well as BeagleBone based devices like BeagleBone Black, BeagleBone Green, Pocket Beagles. There are different images. So since we're working with the Pi in this case, the full image that we used to put on the card was FPP v5.5 pi image.zip. That's the full image to burn onto an SD card like you're first starting out. Likewise, the FPP55 BBB image would be for BeagleBone devices. So if you had a Colt controller or some other BeagleBone driven device, you would use the BeagleBone image. If you got a Raspberry Pi, use a Raspberry Pi image, pretty easy. A couple other, other files you'll see in here are these FPP OS files. And that's what we're gonna talk about right now. FPP OS, there's the Pi, 55 FPPOS and the BBB FPPOS. And item H8, do you recommend a specific version for a specific model of Pi? I always recommend the most current version of FPP. Um, there is new enhancements, bug fixes, and everything else that come into every version. So I most frequently um, recommend the most current version of FPP. Um, one caveat to that, let's say that you're, you know, end of the year. You already have your show kind of up and running and maybe you're just doing a couple extra sequences and technically everything's operational and you're kind of happy with it's in production, so to speak, but you're just working on sequences. I would probably put a freeze and not update anymore. Once you get your show running technically with all your props and your controllers and everything, um, it's perfectly fine to just stay on that version unless you encounter a specific problem that you're trying to solve. Um, but until that time, I say stay with the most recent period because there will be things that may not operate. Um, both FPP and X lights are on rapid development cycles. There are 30, 40, 50 different versions over the course of a year. Um, already in 2022, and you know we're not really into holiday season yet, but already we're on version and X lights are on version um, um, 2022.8. So we're already on the eighth revision since this calendar year. Um, last year, we finished up around 41, I think, then 2021.41. 
And um, FPP 5.5 is done. There will be no new updates on FPP 5.5. They are currently developing and actively working to come out with FPP 6. And they have some alpha images out there now. If you really want to beta test, feel free. But uh, it's not uh, ready for prime time yet. It is getting a complete OS update um, in 5.5. Um, the latest version is best for Pi or Beagle. Yep. And which version of Pi? Uh, pretty much any Pi, right? So any of the Pi 3s, so 3B or 3B plus, they're one gig RAM, plenty to run your show on. I've got 3Bs and um, 3B pluses kind of in my show mainly. I just picked up a couple of 4s. So I now have a couple of Pi 4s, but you do not need a Pi 4, right? Not sure I'm hearing any other specific questions. The chat looks quiet. Thanks, thanks, John, for answering that. So the FPPOS files is what you would need to do an in-place major version upgrade. The difference is when you just do the update through the interface is it's going to update the FPP software packages. It will not update any of the operating system um, modules or anything that might need there. So the FPPOS includes FPP and the operating system both as one package. You can do an online in-place upgrade. Yep, and Tim's still looking for a couple of pies. I did find one, and I was lucky enough to score one at Adafruit the other day. Just showed up yesterday. So um, Adafruit gets them in stock. It seems like daily, but they last about 10 minutes. So I was very lucky to be able to score another pie for two gig RAM. Yeah. But um, they likely will become more available in the next couple of months. It's kind of like the word on the street, but I don't know, uh, not in the industry that way. So uh, earlier I snagged this Pi FPP OS file and once you download it, then you're gonna upload it onto your um, FPP. So you have your FPP already up and running. If I take a look at channel outputs, you can see I've already got some channel stuff configured. We can reconfigure this later. So this is already, this is representative of an FPP that's already up and running and good to go. No, I do not scrape the site. Um, I was in the Zoom room and somebody happened to holler and say, hey, they're available right now. And I was fortunate enough to get in there and get one in the cart and get checked out before they went out of stock. Twice already, I was able to get them in the cart when they were in stock. By the time I hit pay, they were out of stock. And so I missed out, but nope, I don't scrape. <laughs> I know. I do watch RPI Locator. Um, I have not seen them in stock with our pie locator and Adafruit. I set up the email notifications at Adafruit and I've gotten two emails in the last four months. Um, so I don't get notified. I don't rely on their notifications. All right, back to FPP OS to do the major upgrade. Once you come to content setup file manager, this is where you'd see any sequences that were loaded or any audio files. I've already got one audio file in here. Whatnot. But if you go to uploads and then you can upload that file that I downloaded, you can see I already did this because 800 meg, and um, it takes a moment to download and then get pushed up to your FPP. So um, earlier, I had downloaded this FPP OS file and then um, uploaded it into the file manager, content setup file manager, uploads, and it puts it right here. Once it's recognized that a file is here and uploaded, that's when, back on the help about page, you'll see this upgrade OS option. So this will show whatever files have been uploaded from the web, the FPP OS files for a full operating system version. So once that's here, then you just hit upgrade OS. And this will take us through that full operating system and FPP version upgrade all at once. So I'm going to go ahead and hit that now. And this says this can take a long time. Some things I've already done here that'll make it take a little bit less, but we're not gonna talk about that in detail. So once you start the upgrade, it just goes like chunka, 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 and gets done. So any kind of immediate questions on the big version upgrades or anything we've talked about so far? Quiet room. Either that means I've been doing a good job or you all fell asleep, one or the other, right? Oh, I do have a quick question. This Don. Um, yeah. So I know in the in the in the class um, uh, you were you had specifically went to you were going to go to five four and then five five. 
mm-hmm. is going from the five four to five five when you would just do that, um, just the upgrade the mm-hmm. the FPP. You wouldn't have to do the OS. Yeah, yeah, correct. So going to a minor revision, right? So like a five dot four to five dot five, that would just be a um, it would be a branch change. So each dot release is a branch change but that's handled through the regular um, upgrade button that you'll see here, upgrade FPP button that you'll see. You'll only really need to do the upgrade OS button. A, if there's a different version of the OS that becomes available, you'll notice here for the keen eye, would notice that my FPP OS is already at 5.3. That's why this FPP OS update went faster. And then the FPP version is 4.6.1. So the operating system was already upgraded. V5.3 OS build is the most current version of the OS build. There's not any changes to the OS layers as we went from 5.3 to 5.4 to 5.5. There were no differences in the OS. Um, Quick sneak peek, when we get to FPP6 here and when they start releasing mid-summer probably, um, the OS build will be based on like uh, the calendar year it won't be the same versioning because that was causing some people confusion when we went to 5.5 and um, the OS was still 5.3, they think it did an upgrade, but the OS is 5.3 is the correct version of OS for 5.5. So this should have been rebooting and I'm gonna go ahead and click close and it probably rebooted in the background. The browser's automatically refreshed. This is the same device, it's still Pi 1. And uh, this is now the 5.5. So it automatically, you know, rebooted in the background and came up and we're now on 5.5. You will notice that we're on just 5.5. That's what the, is in that FPP OS file. And you'll notice the local Git version and the remote Git version are different. We do have an upgrade is available. So there is a, a minor, oh, Doug O is coming in the room. Let me admit him real quick. I'm watching for him when they come in. Uh, yeah, when he comes in, that's everybody say, about time you showed up, Doug. No, just kidding. <laughs> Doug's a great guy. For anyone who um, was at the mini, Doug was the one that did the 3D print, printing presentation. And he's the one that printed that giant piano with the um, LED matrix in it. Amazing. Doug, about time you made it. We've been waiting on you. Just kidding. So, um. So when there is an update available, you'll see um, here that difference and you'll see this green uh, update is available. Um, and Doug, to catch up real quick, you just went through an FPP OS um, uh, major upgrade from 4.6.1 to 5.5. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and smash this upgrade again and get to the most recent version of 5.5. This is really pretty quick. Um, so throughout the year, there may be like minor tweaks that they bring in. So um, you know, it's not a bad idea to check on their grades every once in a while. And there might be just a minor tweak um, within the same branch. Um, or there might be a different branch. So like going from 5.4 to 5.5 was a different branch. And we did that upgrade in class Saturday too, when we did that. And the reason for those that remember, the 5.5 image, for whatever reason, does not, if I just do a bare bones image, it does not bring up the initial setup page wizard. And I wanted to demonstrate that in the class, which is one reason I did the uh, 5.4 image in class, just so we could demonstrate that initial setup wizard because when they packaged up the 5.5 image, which was very late last year, I think that was like November, late November that the 5.5 came out. Um, uh, for whatever reason, the initial setup page did not does not come up on that image, but it's all water under the bridge. Any other immediate questions? And thanks for joining us, Doug. Glad you made it. So once the upgrade's done down here, you'll notice it says it's restarting the FPP daemon. Update's complete. Click close. When this refreshes, you'll now see that the version's represented as 5.5-18, whatever. This is kind of what it might look like when you do a minor update. We're still in the 5.5 branch, but it's just a minor update. All right, so this guy's now updated to the most recent 5.5. Um, 
checking for any um, questions or anything along the way. Uh, don't hear anything, don't see anything in chat at the moment. So I'm gonna go ahead and talk about FPP as controller in the Excites properties. All right, so like I mentioned earlier, I already had added this Culp K8, which is a Beagle Bone Black based controller that runs FPP on it as well. Um, once you add a controller, it's just a standard ethernet controller. Any um, ethernet controller that is that runs like E131 or ArcNet or DDP, or even um, ZCPP, based protocols you just add as an ethernet. You know, anyone's been around Excites for a while, there used to be a lot of other buttons over here to add different types, but they just kind of wrap that all up into an ethernet based controller for anything expected to communicate on the network for controllers. Once we define a controller on the right-hand side, we select the vendor. In this case, it's a cold plate. So you can see all the different vendor of controllers that are available, we select cold plates. Select the correct model that you have. This is kind of important for when we automatically push configs to the controller. You want to make sure it is the correct version. Example, if you have a K8B, don't pick K8PB. That would be the pocket beagle um, or the K8B scroller. Those are three different distinct controllers. In this case, we're using the B. So the new method on how we configure is all about auto layout and auto size. With the auto layout methods and what I have been referring to for a number of years is the auto magic configuration. And uh, I know, I think Chris is still in here too. I used to work with Chris many years ago and I probably used auto magic back then too. I've been using that for many years. But um, in order to make that work, then you're going to do auto layout and auto size, which allows X lights to automatically configure the start channels of all your models and all your props and it'll automatically configure the correct size that you need to configure the controllers for based on the number of pixels in your models. So we wanna make sure the auto layout models and the auto size check marks are checked. It's kind of best practice. You can still manually configure if you wish, but with the automatic, you don't care about what's a universe, right? And, oh, this prop is ending on universe three, channel 150. So the next one's got to start on universe three, channel 151. You don't have to figure that all out anymore. Let the computer be smart for you and do the auto layout method using the visualize method. We talked about that a little bit in the meeting. On FPP based controllers, you also get this option called auto upload configuration. As a best practice, we recommend this is not check marked. When this is check marked, you can just hover over, get the tool tip, says it will resend your controller configuration anytime you turn on output to lights. So anytime you turn on output to lights, X lights will reconfigure your controller, which may be a good thing, or it may not be a good thing. We have seen this sometimes cause like a remote configured controller to get set to player mode and not set back to remote. So with auto upload configuration enabled, we have seen sometimes controllers not work after you do an output to lights like you're testing or something, right? So leave that unchecked, auto upload configuration unchecked. We do want to go ahead and grant x -Lite's full control of our controller, which also allows us to define a default port brightness automatically. So most of our shows, we do 20 or 30% brightness, because by the time you get 10 or 20,000 pixels or even 1,000 pixels, sometimes they're pretty bright. But you'll have to find the best of brightness based upon where you're at. If you're in a high light lit area, like street lights and stuff, you might want to up this to 40 or 50%, but use your best judgment. When defining a controller, there's an active properties. And there's three different options here, right? This is one thing that gets people in trouble sometimes, uh, or gets them a misconfiguration, not really in trouble, misconfiguration. So by default, when you add a controller, it's set to active. Active means that that controller is going to expect to receive live streaming data over the network to that controller such as the Falcon controller, such as SANS devices, such as Holiday Coro Alpha and Hinkspix controllers, such as a bunch of other Ethernet-based controllers. Active is the correct setting for that controller type. Since we're going to use this FPP-based Culp Lights controller as a remote, we need to make sure this is set to X Lights only. Inactive just means you're not going to use that controller and becomes grayed out. So inactive just means that controller is not going to be part of your show. It's grayed out. Done. So if any FPP-based controller that is going to operate either as your player 
like in case you're using a player and controller combination, or if it's going to be an FPP remote, you want to make sure this active setting is set to X lights only. And we'll show you kind of when you set this, when we do an FPP connect, we'll show you kind of what happens on the controller so you know what to look for. And of course, we configure the proper address. In this case, it's 30.97. Since this is going to be an FPP remote, it really doesn't matter what protocol you define here, but the choices are E131, ArtNet, or DDP. I normally recommend using DDP protocol for any controller that supports DDP. DDP is a little bit more efficient. It, it gives you more data per network packet. So for the same show, you'll have fewer network packets flowing around if you're using DDP protocol as opposed to um, E131. Some controllers don't support it, but yeah, flip coin. Any questions on the initial controller configuration for an FPP based controller? Do Falcons uh, support the DDP? Yes, Falcon V3s, depending on your firmware level, so the F16 V3 and the original F48, the whiteboards, support it with the newest firmware, which is 2.59. They'll support DDP, and all of the V4-based controllers support, um, support um, DDP as well. All right, so once you have your settings in here, once you go visualize, this is a visual representation of your wiring diagram of what should be connected where. So this kind of should represent your physical wiring. So we have on the K8, you have eight ports locally. This port nine through 12 will be a differential port. There's, there's three RJ45 jacks on the K8 for differential receivers. So in this case, nine through 12 is for a differential receiver. 13 through 16 would be for the second. And then 17 through 20 would be for the third. And it has two serial ports for driving DMX or lore or something if you need to. In the visualize, you'll notice that every four ports kind of has this separate color, like the blue, the yellow, the pink. That's just a quick visual representation to show everything on the yellow. If this, this 13 through 16 is referring to a differential um, receiver port on the K8. And so this would just say that 13 through 14 would be that differential receiver because they're four port based differential receivers. It's just coloring to help you make sure you're not actually thinking that 12 through 15 is your differential, right? So it's nine through 12 and 13 through 16 and 17 through 20. So we already have our models in here, right? If we didn't have our models in here, like they'd be over here on the right, we just click and drag and put them on whatever port. I'm gonna plug this chroma bulb into port six when we do this, when we assign the models to a ports, that is what actually configures the starting channel for that model. If you hover over a model, you can see that the start channel begins on absolute channel 3439 and ends on 3941. That's based upon the number of pixels that this chroma bulb has in it, which I think is somewhere around 170 pixels. Or right there, yeah, 170 pixels, it says, right? So. Or is everyone relatively familiar with the visualize, right? And control. And then in my F16, if I go to visualize, so over here, you don't have that auto upload. It's not available on the F16s. The options you get on the right hand side are going to be dependent upon your vendor and model selections. But your auto layout and auto size options will be what does the magic on auto calculating all your channel numbers that you need and being able to upload to the controller. When we visualize the same drag and drop props, remember I get this showstopper, it's broke up into three ports, just the way it was wired, and boom, 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 boom. Of course, once you have that all done, you hit upload output to send to the controller. Down here in the bottom, you should get like a little message down in the status bar. In this case, cold plates output upload complete. That means it was successful. Obviously, it failed means it failed. So when we just did that upload output, what that basically did is let me go to the K8. This is already on 5.5. This guy is running in remote mode already. We'll look at that in a minute. Input output setup channel outputs. In this case, it's a K8. So we're gonna go to the CAPE tab for the CAPE and that's what configured this, right? Just for grins, I'm gonna actually, um, 
can I bulk delete here? It should be the clear top line and then hit clone string from there. Yeah, that'd be that'd be one way of doing it. Yep. I got this virtual one in here. We can delete that virtual one. So we just we'll just set this back to nothing. Save it. Anytime you make a change, there's a save. And most of the time you're going to get this yellow banner at the very top, restart FPPD. Uh, which is just your software daemon that makes it reread all the config files and make sure that any changes that you've made are now active. So we now have zero ports configured at all. If I go back to X sites, say upload output, down here at the bottom says uploading, says complete. Go back to the web page, just hit a refresh, and everything's back in there automatically. So it just sent that data from X lights to your controller. You don't have to configure anything on the controller, just push it. And pretty much the same for the F16. Um, this is already, um, oh, actually I was playing with this one earlier because I changed that smart receiver configuration. So let's go to the F16 and just re-push, re-upload it. On the Falcon controllers, depending on what changes are made when you upload outputs, it may do a reboot. It may not do a reboot, just depending on what you may have changed. I had configured the variant manually to be uh, 16 local ports plus smart receivers instead of just 16 local ports. That's why it went ahead and did a reboot. But now if I refresh, you can see it's back to 16 local ports only. I go to my output settings. I only have the 16 ports and I see the showstopper down here on 14, 15, 16. Any um, questions on the controller configuration? The real key on Falcon FPP based controllers is this active setting over here, setting this to X lights only. Otherwise, you're likely you're going to be sending duplicate data, get all kinds of weird jittery blinky stuff and just uh, like, um, pulsing, you'll get weird outputs if you leave that as active and um, and uh, do a FPP connect. You said do that with Falcons also? No, the Falcons, because the Falcons don't run FPP, right? They have their own firmware and all that. They need to be active because they're expecting to receive the data across the network, right? So the, the FPP when you do player remote mode, um, how can I best describe this? So I'm gonna flip back to my presentation in the networking page here. So presume this top controller is the K8 that we have in our setup. And it's not a picture of a K8. And then presume this bottom one is the F16. So in active mode, the FPP is going to send all of the channel data for however many channels it is, whether 40, 50,000 channels, 3,000 channels, like in our small setup here, whatever, is going to send that channel data, live streaming it over the network to the controller. So to the Falcon, in normal operation, is going to expect to receive that over the network in an E131 or a DDP protocol. Okay. The CULP, there's one up on top, just remember that's representative of a cult. It can run in that same method where it will actively receive the, net, the, the traffic over the network. To minimize that traffic over the network, you can run it in remote, which means that the FPP will be playing, the primary player will be playing a sequence. The remote also gets a copy of the sequence. And when the player plays, he's going to send a command to the remote I'm playing sequence called All Butterfly, start now. And so they're both playing a local copy of the sequence. So this FPP will be playing a local copy of the sequence and this K8 controller in our show we got set up here will be playing a local copy of the sequence and it will just send a time sync command over the network say, you need to be at this spot, you need to be at this spot, you need to be at this spot. So it's very, very light traffic on the network Instead of showing, sending all of the real-time show data, it's just sending a time sync packet saying, make sure you're at this spot, make sure you're at this spot. And it just keeps sending those, those multi-sync packets 
to say keep it in sync, but your play is happening locally on the controller. So large virtual matrices, big matrices, high density props that will greatly reduce the potential lag you may have on that controller. Because if you set up a large virtual matrix, you might be sending you know, 100,000 channels to that controller and 100,000 channels is gonna be broke up into how many network packets, right? So you're either sending those network packets expecting that you know, sub millisecond response because they're synchronized, remember? We don't care about bandwidth, we care about time of delivery. Because if you got a 40 frames for a second sequence, then you're getting completely different data every 25 milliseconds. So any latency that you add is gonna cause you what looks like um, a lag or a non-synchronous show. Where the FPP remote really comes in handy is it's playing that locally. It's not sending 100,000 channels over the network. It's just sending a couple of small sync packets over the network. So it doesn't have to wait on that delivery of data to get there. The you know, 20 or 30,000 network packets that it might need to in every 25 milliseconds, right? So Falcons are always going to be active. So it, it is uh, it is optional, and I'll just go ahead and clarify because on a V4, you can configure a V4 in remote mode with a local SD card, and it will function as an FPP remote. So if you're on the status page, controller mode, this one, I've got mine set up in E131 right now because I was doing some testing with somebody else, which is fine. But you can also put it in remote master and player Master and player are kind of um, um, limited players. You know, they, they work if you just have like the one controller, maybe a two. Um, but it can operate in an FPP remote if you had an SD card in it. But that's not typical. Um, some people do run in that way. But by and far, they're pretty much all going to receive E131 or DDP protocol live streamed over the network. And can I answer the question? Yep. Um, and back to Facebook. So we kind of talked a little bit about setting up FPP um, as a controller and um, and you went over some of the properties and stuff. So next we're going to review a little bit on FPP Connect. That's how you're going to, we're going to configure. Before we're doing that, let's go ahead and make a, a quick little sequence. I'm going to jump over to the sequencer. Actually, I already have this and saved anyway, but um, basically I'm going back to layout tab real quick. So this is our, the models that we have, right? I created a group called all that contains all of these models because I'm super creative. So <laughs> created a group called all and on the sequencer, I just threw a butterfly effect on all group. So that is now playing across. You can see in the previews over here, it's actually playing on all the pixels. Um, let me bring back up my, my little list here and do 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 and I'm going to go ahead and output to lights. And we should see some flashy blinky pixel lights back there on my table, right? So I'm going to turn the output to lights off. Lights go off. I'll put your lights on. That's representative of the mother of all wreaths and the showstopper sequence. So that's one item on um, the K8 and one item on the F16. So lights are flashing. Yay. Initial test done. Successful test from X lights. Um, did everybody see that on the table? We're kind of okay on the camera. Yeah. I'm going to um, render this sequence. Should go by really pretty quick because it's just one effect on the model, on a group. I'm going to save it. So, whatever sequences I have, I'm going to render and save. And then we're going to go to um, tools and FPP Connect. This is how we send the sequence and everything that we need. Um, to the FPP devices. Um, while we're on this page, this is what's been discovered. I'm going to um, real quickly jump back here to the Pi. This is the player. Um, I need to move my Zoom windows out of the way again. Content Setup File Manager. You can see I've got no sequence files in here. This is the KAB Content Setup File Manager. No sequence files, right? Cool. So Would this be on the SD card or on the on the 
I every, so. everything on these devices is on the SD card. There is no storage locally on Pies at all. Some of the bigger one blacks have an EMMC, but it's only four gigabyte in size. If it's a bigger one black Rev C, it's got like a four gig EMMC that's just not used in our hobby. Everything FEP, everything is on the micro SD card. Just think of the micro SD card like the hard drive in your computer. So anything that's permanently stored is on the micro SD card. Yep. So they will be on the micro SD card. I was just trying to figure out why you can get one, two, four, and eight gig byte. That's RAM on the Pi 4. So that's the amount of RAM or random access memory. That's yeah. not uh, storage that's available on the devices. Everything is really on the uh, Pi's have no permanent storage whatsoever. It's, everything's on the micro SD card or a USB drive. If you're attached to a USB drive, we just don't do that with FPP um, USB drives. But I just want to demonstrate there are no sequences here currently on either of these two FPP devices. So when we did the FPP Connect, it auto discovered these um, devices, the Pi 1 is our player with multi-sync enabled. Um, I really didn't want multi-sync enabled yet, but that's okay. Um, it was in, enabled due to the upgrade. Then we have the K8, which is currently configured as a remote. Um, when you have these selected, this means that this is what we're gonna send to. So in this case, we're gonna send to both of these devices. So they're both selected. Your player is the one that's gonna have the audio attached. So we only want the player to um, get media. Do not send media to remotes or any other devices. So media means your song files, whether your sequence was created with an MP3 or your sequence was created with an MP4 video as the audio source. This will send the audio files to your player um, FPP. Models you can choose to do or not. Models is solely used for display testing and the FPP display testing, where any models you have to find in next lights, it'll configure those on your FPP so that you can do display testing model by model by model. As a regular practice on the player device, I usually put all models, um, but this you, there's different opinions on whether you want the models there or not. They're only used for display testing. So you can make your own selections on what you want there. UDP out is a very key um, column here. So none means that this device is not going to send any pixel data across the network. So by default, it's, this is set to none. And so people say, well, I did FPP connect, but I'm playing on my player, but my Falcon's not responding. It's not doing anything. No lights are going on. Most likely they forgot to set this UDP out because when this is default set to none, look at the tool tip, then this device is not going to send any pixel data over the network. Since we have a Falcon in this demonstration, we do want it to send to all, which means this device will send pixel data over your show network from the FPP instance to all controllers marked as active. Real key there, all is it will send data to all controllers marked as active. Right, and that's, ties us back to the controller tab we had when we set the, the KAB to X lights only because we do not want to send data over the network. We're going to run him in the um, player remote multi-sync mode. And proxied, we'll talk a little bit more when we talk about networking at the tail end of the night, we'll talk about the proxied option. So your player, if you have other controllers you're sending data to, you want this at all. Check question. So why wouldn't they have default to all? Because there's a lot of use cases that where you don't want the default to all. Example, if you're doing FPP controllers only, then you would just set that to none because you're not going to send data over the network to any of the FPP devices. So if you have a show with nothing but Culps, then yeah, it's just, yeah. It's hard to predict. Everybody's show is going to be different. So it's kind of Troy entered the waiting room. I'm going to admit Troy. I'm not sure which Troy that is, but he's coming in. And I, I think I know which Troy it is, but he'll uh, say he was going to be late. So um, it's just responsible to make sure you know what these settings are. And obviously, if you hover over the tooltips, the tooltips give you pretty good ideas, right? It's not bad. Uh, models, enable to upload models for display testing. Media is enable to upload MP3s and MP4s, media files. We didn't really talk about FSEQ type yet, so we'll come back to that probably now. So there's multiple types of FSEQ files. So the players, whether you're using XSchedule or FPP, are going to play the FSEQ binary file type. That's a non-editable file type. 
and there's different versions. V1, we don't use anymore at all. That's very old. V2 is the new method. But we also have V2 sparse compressed or, you know, Z standard. And yes, I'm saying my Z is like Z because I've been talking to Australians too much. And then uh, you have a V2 sparse uncompressed. So by default, it's usually the V2 sparse compressed. Some people prefer on your player, especially if you have multiple controllers, to send the full V2 to the player. What, what these options do, especially the sparse options, is when we do an upload with the ZPP Connect, it's going to look at the contents of your sequence and it will configure a specific FSGQ file with data for this controller only. So in this case, for this K8B, your FSEQ will only contain channel data that is assigned to that controller. So it helps keep your FSEQ file small and smaller. But that also means that every FSEQ file on each individual controller will be different because it'll only contain the channel data for that specific controller, which is why it's probably a good practice for your player because you want him to have the sequence for all your controllers to have him set to V2. Now, it just so happens if I do set UDP out to all, it's going to get all of the FSEQ anyway, right? It's going to get all channel data anyway if I do F UDP out all. But it's not a, a bad idea on your player to set this to V2 and make sure you get the full V2, um, um, the, the full uh, show content inside that FSEQ that goes to your player. Other options we see at the top. So this top is like our configuration. This is how you can configure your FPP devices. And the bottom here are the different sequences that are available in my show folder. On the CULP or anything that has like a cape or a hat that's configured on the right-hand side, you have this check mark called whatever the cape is. In this case, it's KAB. So basically with this checked, it does effectively the same thing as your upload outputs. So every time you go to FPP Connect and you upload, I just finished a new sequence, you wanna come upload it. If this is checked, it just resends that channel output data every time you do an FPP Connect upload. Personally, I prefer to have it on. That way, if there are any changes in your layout or any changes in your models, that it will always get those changes when you do an FPP Connect. So that's kind of the detail on the configuration at the top and then here for the sequence at the bottom. Quick question. Yeah, fire away. On, on, those, on those settings that you're doing up there, mm -hmm. uh, does it stay defaulted at those once you set them? Right, so once you change these settings and you do an upload, mm -hmm. then these settings up here stay to the last. So it's when you hit upload, it saves those setting states. And so it'll always default to these setting states every time you hit upload. So it, will it default to those every time when you do FPP connect? Correct, correct. So it, when, yeah. so, so if I, I just changed this by earlier, this was sparse mm -hmm. and we'll do an upload and then we'll come back in here again, but. Okay. Right. So every time you come into FPP Connect to open up this utility and hit upload, then it will um, um, save those settings. So if I come back into FPP Connect again, that top one should be on V2 instead of V2 sparse. See, it's still there on V2, right? And I did not have the models checked earlier and I did check the models. So it saves this every time you have an upload, it saves it. Thank goodness. Just, just like last remember state. that. Exactly, <laughs> just like last state, last state. Good question, good question. We did go ahead and select this all butterfly. Now, the other thing, when you see your sequences in here, this is just a sample show folder, so I don't have a lot. When you see the sequences in here, um, I always pay attention to this modified date. And you can sort by modified date or maybe sorted by name by default. This also saves the sort order now. It did not use to save the sort order, but it does now. I'm currently in X sites 2207 is the version. I've not upgraded to eight yet. Um, and so I always pay attention to this modified date, make sure it makes sense to you. So this says 419 at 1955. That was just uh, you know 10 minutes ago when I hit save and next slide. So that makes sense to me. Sometimes people go make changes in next slides and they re-render and they re-render and they push to FPP and it's just not working and it's just not right. Well, sometimes you forget to hit save and you keep re-uploading the older version. So pay attention to this up uh, modified date if you've just made sequence changes. So when we hit upload, this will send the configuration data and the sequence to our, our um, devices. 
you know, no, we're about eight o'clock. So we're already, I mean, we started a little bit late, which I'm uh, kind of cool with, but uh, so now if I come back to um, the pie and refresh this page, you can now see this all butterfly sequence showing up on your content um, setup file manager. We do see, uh, and I think some of that's probably hidden because I had my zoom windows open. So um, content setup file manager and then sequences. We now have that sequence there. This date is the date that it was uploaded to FEP. It may not match the actual sequence modified date. This is the date that it was written to FPP. So that's the date that you did the upload. And if we look at the K8 and just refresh this page, you can see that sequence files there as well. 1.13, 1.76, see the difference in size because the K8 we sent the sparse into the pie, we sent the full. So there are different sizes on those FACQs. They are different because the K8 only got the channel data based upon the props and models that were assigned to it. Okay, blowing through that, that was the review of the FPP Connect utility and those settings. Another quick question. Other questions, Back fire Go ahead. On, uh, on, on how much uh, data did the models, would it have increased that file size to your Pi 1? Is the, the models are not contained in this file size at all. So when we choose the models, that's not part of the FSEQ at all. Okay. So the models will show up. Um, let me go back to the Pi. Input, output, setup, and pixel overlay models. So input, output, setup, we can define inputs for it to receive data. Outputs is how it sends data. Output processors are kind of, you don't need to worry about that. Mainly you can do different things with the, you could remap channel data and all that kind of stuff. There's some more advanced things you can do there. Pixel overlay models are where it creates your models. So you'll notice we have two sections here at the top and at the bottom. The bottom is auto-created models because five, FPP 5.x, will auto-create models for any model that's defined to an output. Now this is our player, so there's no models defined on him, so there's no auto-created models, but these are the models that were sent from FPP Connect. So we've got our chroma bulb starting at 3439 for 510 channels. We got our canes, we got our whatever, our rosary, and so we have these models defined in here. Where that is used, if under status and control, Right, our status page is our main working page. Right, this is where we normally do our play and stop and all that kind of stuff. Right, we can do display testing, status control display testing, and here we can by default we can have all models. So these are all models defined, all, all channels defined, and we can say start outputting test. So I got some blinky blinky going on in the back, or you can pick a specific model and say, I want to test the showstopper snowflake. And then these, you know, I see start and end channels change down here based upon the model. And then when I turn that on, then that model and that model only should be the one that's highlighting when I'm doing my display testing. This is display testing from FPP. That's, that's where models come in place. So the models are defined on the input and output setup pixel overlay models. This is what got pushed from FPP Connect. And then they're used in the status control display testing in order to do individual model by model testing. I could do the chroma bulb and say, did the chroma bulb light up? I currently don't have anything plugged into that port. So that nothing's lighting up right now because I just don't have that chroma bulb plugged in. I don't have those models here. Those went back to Nebraska with Vinny. Um, now on the, the Culp K8, you'll notice we did not choose models in FPP on the K8, right? So if I go to input output setup, just Display overlay models. This top section, this is where you can either manually create models or get pushed from X sites. There's nothing there, but it automatically created models for these specific models because these, you know, it's the um, showstopper snowflakes not here because that's not defined on this controller. That's defined on the Falcon controller. So this will automatically create uh, models based upon the output definition in channel outputs, K8. These are the models that were assigned to this controller. So it automatically created overlay models based upon this controller definition. And those two can be used in display testing model by model. I can pick and choose these specific models in order to, um, to uh, test. 
um, G rosary that's plugged into port one and that's one if I turn that test on and I've got that sample string is plugged in on that port one is now lighting up. Is that going to apply to a custom model as well? Yeah. yeah. So the G roads wreath is a custom model, right? So it's, it's basically, if I go back to X lights and layout tab and all of your models in here, this is going to be like, this is start channel one to 2088 for the rosary. And this is a custom model, but let's say you created something. This, this snowflake is an example of a very custom model. This isn't vendor specific. This is something that Vinny had made in this white snowflake. So it starts at 2683. Absolute channels in the brackets, in the parentheses, and ends at 3438. So if I go back to FPP and take a look at White Snowflake, 2683, 3438, those should exactly match. 2683, 3488, those exactly match because that's what's defined on the output page. And this was pushed from X lights, right? We didn't manually configure any of this. This was all done by X lights. So Start channel 2683 and channel 3438, that all matches, right? That kind of makes sense so far? Absolutely. No, I, I, I appreciate you covering each one of these. <laughs> yeah, 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 and then the devil's in the details, right? Because there's so many different options and choices depend on your specific show and how you plan to use it, right? Some people might have a Pi FPP um, for a player only and no controller at all and talk to Falcon controllers or Advitech or Hinks picks or something, right? Some other controller type. Uh, Facebook, um, where's my, right here. Da, 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 da. So that was a PP Connect. So um, if we don't have any other media questions, I'm going to go into play remote. I do see a chat. Um, lore, Lighterama. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, can FPP Connect be your show player for Lighterama shows? And the answer to that is yes. Depending on how you have your Lighterama set up and if you're running like off of a controller or a USB dongle, you can plug a lower USB dongle into a Raspberry Pi and you can define a lower output type and you can output straight to your lower devices from FPP. Yeah. Lighterama probably doesn't want to support and condone that, but it works just fine. So I'm probably going to run into player remote mode. We've already been kind of talking about that a little bit, but I'm going to, when we go back to our network diagram, player remote means I've got the player that's doing the playing and the remote is also playing the sequence. And um, there's just a time sync packet that goes between them. Right. So back to FPP player, I'm going to go to Another quick tip in FPP5, status control status page. Remember, this is kind of where we normally spend all of our, you know, play and, you know, play a test. And that probably is not set up for anything. So that's probably not going to do anything. But I can pick the all butterfly and play. And I can stop it, right? And this is our status page. If you click this little FPP logo up in the corner, that also takes you straight to that page. So if I'm on my file manager or anywhere else in the menuing system, click this FPP in the corner, that takes us immediately to the status page. Boom. One click stopping. There's one, one click shopping, something like that, right? What's the Amazon word? One, one click buy? One click buy? Anyway, so um, when, when working in player remote mode, it uses a protocol called multi-seek. And you get a ton of data by going to status control and the multi-sync page. So the multi-sync page is actually going to discover all of the FPP-based devices. And it gives you a lot of information about those devices, what their host name is, what their IP address is, what platform they are, what, what mode they're currently operating in, what their status page, et cetera. You'll notice this also discovered a third entry here, this 30.65. What is that? This happens to be my Falcon 16 V4 because a V4 can be configured to receive multi-sync. Right now it's in an unknown system type in an unknown mode. Sometimes this will actually say 16 V4, but it's, it's not currently configured to receive multi-sync commands. So that's why it's in an unknown mode because it's just not configured that way, but it still shows up in the discovery. So when I do a, um, when I go to status control multi-sync, um, 
it will uh, show up um, in the discovery. So uh, you could potentially send multi-sync commands to it. Um, I'm gonna disable something here real quick just for demonstration purposes. So I'm gonna turn that off. It's gonna ask me to restart at PPD. <laughs> all right, all right. So this shows now it's a player mode, the status is idle. We have what version it is, it's easy to see. What Git versions, this is another place to say, if I've got five or six FPP devices, they all show up here. And then I can see what my local Git version and my remote Git version is. And if these match, then this will be green, right? Let's say that there's an upgrade available, then this will likely be red in the remote and local Git version. So it's just another place to look to see if an upgrade's available. You get some CPU usage and memory usage reporting, and you get a couple check marks over here to check and choose. You can take multiple actions. Well, excuse me. You can take an action on multiple FPP devices at a time. So if I choose this top check mark, it, it selects all FPP, true, true FPP devices. So there are other devices that might receive multi-sync commands and function like an FPP remote, but they don't actually run FPP. So like Falcon V4s are one of them, a Pixel Stick with the new uh, Pixel Stick 4.0 beta firmware in the Unify branch with an SD card can function as an FPP remote and they would show up in here also, but this check marks won't be available. Right? It just depends on what type of device it is. Once you select multiple devices, the select action down here, these are actions that you could do on, uh, so you can upgrade FPP, you can restart FPPD, you can reboot them all, you can shut them all down. You can manually copy show files or OS upgrade files, or you can set them to player remote. So these are actions that you can perform on multiple FPP devices all at the same time. Example, if I chose an action to say restart FPPD and say run, you get this little command box pop up and it's saying restarting. And as it goes through up at the top, you'll see FPPD stopped. And then as it goes through and restarts, it says APPD was restarted. This is the log. So on this PI1, it restarted APPD. You can close log because that's done. And on this KAB, it restarted. So you can close log. So we just, from this one command, we chose both those devices and restarted APPD on both devices. This is convenient if you want to do like a, just a minor upgrade on yet six or seven APP devices. You can select them all and do uh, uh, an upgrade all at once, right? You upgrade and then run. I'm not going to do an upgrade because they don't need an upgrade right now. This also shows you the current status as far as what's playing and not playing, right? Um, so let's go back to status control. Let's pick that sequence we uploaded, the infamous all butterfly. I'm going to set this on repeat because it's only a 30 second sequence. So I'm going to hit play, right? So this should now be playing. I've got lights flashing on the table, but if you'll notice, you may not be able to tell on the table. There's a string around the chairs that are not lighting up. They're not doing anything. Wait a minute. So I've got, essentially, I got the showstopper play, playing right now, but the mother of all wreaths is not playing. Okay. Why is it? Well, let's go take a look. So while it's playing, if you go back to that multi-sync page, this will give you the status. Now down here at the bottom, it's auto refresh stats is not always checked. So we'll go and turn that on. And we can see that our player is playing. It's currently 11 seconds elapsed, 12 seconds elapsed, but our remote, this KAB remote, is sitting idle. By the way, when you go to FPP5, this is the default behavior you're going to see. Why are my remotes not playing? Well, that's because you actually have to enable multi-sync. What I just temporarily turned off a little bit ago, you actually have to enable that. It's not enabled by default. So if anyone's used FPP4 or older, you had like the standalone mode, you had like a master mode, you had a remote mode, and you had a bridge mode. And sometimes, sometimes those got confusing for some people, right? So basically right now, this is functioning the same as FPP4 standalone mode, which means he's the only guy. He's not going to send any multi-sync commands. So in order to put him in what would have been known as master mode, we have to go under settings on this still SAS control multi-sync page, go under settings, and we have to turn on send multi-sync packets. This is the magic sauce that tells this player to send 
the multi-sync commands to any remote players that would be available. So once we enable that, again, back here at the top, it's going to say restart FPPD. Again, when we make any significant um, changes, it's going to want to restart those daemons to reread all the config files. I'm going to refresh this page, come back to settings. So there's a couple of other check marks here now that weren't here a minute ago. So now we are sending multi-sync packets and we're sending them by default. We send multi-sync using a network multicast protocol. That's default and typically preferred, which kind of means it's going to send the multi-sync packets to anybody on the network that's listening for them. So if you had multiple players, then they all would be listening for multi-sync. So it's kind of like a, a spray method where it sends the packets out to anybody who wants to listen. Is multi-sync, multicast method. Some networks may not behave properly with multicast, just depends on your particular home network setup. So you may have to change that and set it to either broadcast method or unicast. You'll notice that there's a checkbox up here. Now that multi-sync's enabled, there's a checkbox. You would check that checkbox to the unicast. I'm going to leave it in the default multicast for now. If I try to enable multiple ones, you normally get like a little message up here. Uh, well, it didn't give you a message, but I guess the new version, it automatically unselects multicast. You notice that? It automatically unse unselected that. So that's the change. It used to be if you try to turn them both on, you'd get an error message up here at the top. But anyway, cool. Um, I'm going to leave that on multicast. Since I made that change, I'm going to restart PPD. Go back to the status page. Select our all butterfly sequence. Hit play. And now as we view the little pixels on the edge of the chairs, they're now playing. That's representative of the GE mother of all wreaths. So our multi-sync is now playing. I forgot to hit, uh, that was probably going to time out in a little bit. So let me uh, stop that. I want to hit repeat and play again. While it is playing, everything is now working. If we go look at multi-sync tab, right? Status control multi-sync. We can see now that both the player and the remote are actively playing the same sequence in the elapsed time. You can see the elapsed time on that. Now, if anybody who observed just a moment ago, the player was at 12 and the remote was at 13, likely because you know it was a little bit skewed and it just had its in, it got that time sync packet saying, this is where you need to be, right? So it, that 30 second sequence just started over. So this is a great troubleshooting page, this status control multi-sync for all your FPP devices. You can see what's playing and what's not playing and where they're at in the elapsed time. If we go to the actual K8B page and go to its status page, we can see since it's in remote mode down here, you can see that it's receiving multi-sync packets from this device last received 589 milliseconds ago. Um, I don't think I've got live updates on, turn this live update on. And you can see how many um, sequence sync packets have been opened and started, how many stops, media syncs. So you can kind of get an idea of how many sync packets are coming in and kind of watch how this is going, right? So this gives you like a, a status page about what it's receiving on the remote KAB. Does that kind of explain uh, the player remote mode and multi-sync a little bit? Any questions on that? I know we're going through this relatively fast, but trying to be somewhat thorough as well. I hear no questions. So if I uh, jump back briefly to our little agenda list, it kind of gets through the player remote mode, multi-sync. So now is the time we're going to kind of talk about a separate show network mode. Flip back to our drawing here. So we're basically representative of, I've got a um, representative home router right now and this network setup that happens to be a 30, 192.168.30. My PC is plugged into it. I want to do an IP config on my PC. Minimize and move my camera view item out of the way a little bit. Um, my wireless is connected to my home network. That's where I'm hopefully talking to Zoom over. And then I've got a wired Ethernet adapter that's plugged into that 30 network. My PC is 30.110. We've already seen our controllers, what they've been 30 dot somethings, right? 
And so right now my PC is plugged into basically the home, the representative home router, the 30 network. My FPP and my controllers are all plugged onto the 30 network, plugged into like a network switch this way. This is kind of how we're set up right now. Going to the wired on a separate show network. Basically what we're gonna do is I'm going to change my home computer ethernet to be representative of a new home network. This case is going to be 192.168.4. And um, then we're going to wirelessly connect the FPP device to that dot four network. So he will have his wireless on dot four and his ethernet still on dot 30. So the dot 30 network is going to become the show network in this case, just in our setup here. The dot 30 is going because that way I don't have to re IP the controllers or anything and all our config or everything that we've done so far is going to stay the same. So it's that becomes the 30 becomes our show network and our home network is going to become dot four. But just so I don't lose access to everything, I'm going to configure the wireless on the FPP first. And we'll get a dot four address. And then I'll change the ethernet side on the home computer to be on that same dot four network. And we'll look and we'll know that we won't have access to our controllers or anything anymore, right? So I had a quick question on all that. Sure. And I don't know if this is even possible, but could you have two um, wireless cards in your computer? One to bring in the internet to the computer and one to communicate to the FPP? Or is that not? Potentially, a... but you may not want to do that, right? So your computer with the second wireless card is not going to run in access point mode, right? So are there some ways we can kind of do something goofy? Potentially. One thing to keep in mind is your FPP device ideally always has internet access so he can get the proper time sync from a network time protocol server, an NTP server. So you always want your APP device to be able to get to the net, to the internet somehow, whether that's wireless through your home network or through whatever method. Um, it just so happens that my dot 30 network also has access out to the internet. Um, in this case, now in a true segregated show network, the show network would not have direct internet access. So can you do wireless from your PC straight to FPP. FPP has the ability to manually set up what's called tethering mode and it can function as an access point. So your computer could theoretically connect to the broadcast FPP wireless SSID and connect to that on a specific predefined network. So the possible but then your FPP does not have internet access, so it will never have the correct time. So if you're trying to do a scheduled based show, say start at six o'clock, it's never gonna know when six o'clock really is. You know what I mean? Yep. Yeah. I guess the one thing I was trying to eliminate was um, the fact that, you know, like I have probably like 60 items hooked up to my internet. Mm -hmm. So I think that's probably where that uh, dot zero comes into play that you're talking about. As long as you're your on home, like, your home right now, it's probably be dot zero, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I have anywhere from 30 to 100 devices powered up in my home right all the time. So I have a IT lab set up in the back and we'll talk about that another time if you want. I've got all kinds of, I've got more enterprise scale equipment in my back office than what most small businesses have because that's my real world I live in every day. So I was just trying to eliminate yeah. all of that traffic on... So in this model, when, when FPP connects to your home or, or your home Wi-Fi here, there is no traffic there. Okay. Right. That's only going to be for your your home computer. When you do X lights on your X lights computer, and I wish this graphic that said X lights computer instead of home computer. So you're going to do all your sequencing thing and everything on this home computer, and then you're going to upload through the FPP Connect to this FPP device. So that's going to be just when you do your uploads through right. FPP Connect. Right. So that's how you would administer the FPP device, but there's no actual show data that would flow over this wireless link. Because remember, the show data will be playing on the FPP to the controllers. So it'll go from the FPP through this switch to the controllers, and that will never, ever, ever flow back up to your internet. Right. So 
the app will be able to talk to the internet in order for it to get updates and in order to get time sync so right in here we're talking about wireless access control oops oops i didn't mean to click so you have wireless access for control which means your computer you can control this app and you can make updates but you can also do app updates and you can get time sync if you're connected to your home internet router this way, but there will be no traffic on your home internet from the show, no show traffic. Does that kind of makes sense? Yep. So um, back to the pie. So we're gonna go to status control and network. And I'm going to, um, I'm actually gonna, because I had this set up earlier, I'm gonna delete these, sorry. Pay no attention to what I'm doing right now because we're going to come back and talk about this in a minute. And then uh, status control network interface settings. Um, I'm also going to pay attention here real quick. I'm going to re make a mental note or scribble it down or write it wherever in your documentation that the K8 is 30.97 and the um, F16 is 30.65. So we'll need those actual IPs um, here shortly. But for right now, we're going to um, status control network and then interface settings. I'm going to choose to configure the WLAN interface. This 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 show is still playing, by the way. The pixels are still going in the background because I set it to play on repeat. I just noticed it's still playing up here. So this is kind of a great status panel up here at the top. We haven't talked about that a whole lot, but the status panel up here gives you your currently configured hosting. We call this one Pi One when we were in class last Saturday. Um, it's currently um, playing or idle or stopped or whatever. This is the status. We got CPU core temperatures. Right now it's in Celsius. You can change it to Fahrenheit. And we see this ETH zero address, an Ethernet based address on 30.69. Right. So when we configure the wireless, we'll see another WLAN zero. Um, address up here that will be the wireless address. Okay, we've got the current time and then what model of device this is a Raspberry Pi for. So uh, once I go to WLAN zero on the interface and down here at SSID, once I click in this box, it should show me any, any wireless SSIDs that are reachable from where I'm at right now, right? Um, yes, five or six. Wireless, wireless points. There's, there's a lot of stuff around and yes, five or six of these are mine. But uh, <laughs> Um, I'm going to connect to one called Home Show. You know, I run a, a, you know, just at my house here, all my Christmas light stuff is usually on a dedicated network. And But anyway, that's just presume this is your home Wi-Fi, whatever it is. So it's Home Show in my case. And I'm going to give it a, uh, a uh, the password that is defined for that network. I'm going to show it real quick. So because I'm super creative, my real passwords are not really this nice, but it's just my LED show with a capital M. All right, so to make sure that you're typing your pre-shared key for your wireless properly, so you can show and hide, right? You know, publicly, if you're in the Zoom room and stuff like that, you know, if you want to show, great. If you don't, but just make sure that's correct or you may not, you will not join if that's incorrect. So once we kind of defined it, we have to do update interface, which basically just writes that configuration to the SD card on the Raspberry Pi. Not active yet, but as soon as we did update interface, that writes that configuration. Notice I'm leaving it on DHCP right now because I just want to test, can I join the wireless network, right? So once I join successfully, feel free to change it to a static IP address if you like, right? But I don't, I won't define the static IP address till after I join successfully, just to make sure that, because there's two different problems that can occur. Either A, you didn't join the Wi-Fi or B, you join the Wi-Fi, but you have an incorrect IP address to find. Then you get kind of stuck, right? So we're gonna do DHCP for now, get it joined successfully. Now that we did the update interface and wrote that configuration up here, you get a little notification. Then we're gonna say restart network. When you go restart network, it says this could, blah, 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 right? Could cause you to lose connection, make you have to reconnect if IPs change. We're just gonna say yes. So it's gonna restart the network services. Sometimes when configuring wireless, a restart of the network is not enough. It may not really initiate. So you might have to do a reboot on the Pi, right? Whether it's go and pull the power and plug it back in. If it's still reachable, you can do a reboot down here at the bottom as well. But you notice mine actually joined and up here in this top corner, 
I actually have the wireless symbol and it looks like it grabbed the IP from DHB of 192.168.4.171. So four would represent like the zero in your case, um, Tim. So that would represent your home network and 30 you would represent our show network. Um, once you're successfully configured, you could always come in here and define a static address and configure um, statics. Uh, I don't always use static myself, but I highly recommend you do. Um, when you define that static IP, you can use that IP that it came up with, right? Yeah, well, yes. So that's saying that that's the available IP address. You can, so well, here's part of the rub. Um, I'm going to log into this particular router that's showing my, that's my um, 30.1. This is the router that's serving my show network, um, my network. So if you're able to log into your router that serves DHCP, um, this particular type of router, this is a little portable travel router. This is a white travel router that was on the board for those that were in the class. Um, when I show clients, it shows my current DHCP clients and it shows the current devices that are, you know, the KB, the P1, the F16. This is a switch that's plugged in. This is a computer I have in my back office that's plugged into the same network right now. Um, and then this is my laptop. And these are devices that are no longer connected. I have a, a pixel stick device that is also, um, uh, mounted to this board, but it's just currently not powered off. These are offline. So when you log into your router, you should be able to see a client list and get IPs and stuff, but also you can see um, under more settings in this one, LAN IP, what your DHCP addresses are. So in this case, for this particular router, this one starts at 51 and ends at 150. So if you get an address this 4171 is what we got on my wireless. So if I statically configure that for 4171, that's legal. Depending on your router, that falls within the DHCP range of your router because that was a DHCP address. Your router may try to give that address to a different device down the road. So if you do DHCP and then statically use that same IP, you may end up with an IP address conflict down the road because your router may choose to offer that DHCP address to some other device that you join to the network down the road. Maybe you buy a new toaster that's a Wi-Fi enabled toaster and you may get that same address and then you wonder why your controller doesn't work anymore. I was so actually I looking at one of those. A, a Wi-Fi enabled toaster? Yeah, <laughs> it's compatible. Yeah, nice, nice. <laughs> is, that is that toast to dark, please? <laughs> um, so normally when statically assigning, my re my recommendation is to pick an available address that's not within your DHCP range on your router. So like in this particular router case, it starts at 51 and goes to 150. So I could pick like, you know, 151, 152, 153, or I could pick like, you know, 20, 30, 40, something that's outside of that DHCP range. And that's going to really vary router by router by router by router. And you just have to know it, right? If you don't know how to get into your home router and you don't want to mess with that and you just want to statically assign to the same address that your DHP gave you, go for it. Just be prepared that you might end up with an IP address conflict down the road. Um, most good DHP servers will not allow you, will not actually assign an address to something that has a static assigned address because it'll do a check. Before it hands out an address, it should do a ping check to ping if that address is available but a lot of your consumer grade home routers just don't have that functionality. Um, Run. So mm -hmm. I like you have a network background and that's what I do every day. Mm -hmm. So I do all mine with DHCP reservations. Correct. Yeah. You, you can certainly do that. Right. So that would be another option in this case. Right. GLI Somebody GLI has to be router. familiar with the router to be able to do those kind of things, but that, right. that helps in that situation. Right. And uh, if I, um, and this particular router type right here on the same page under the LAN IP where you define what your network is, what your DHCP range is down here, static IP address binding. If I knew that I can look at the client list, example, 
the pi for this, the this is the wired site interface, right? So if I were to copy this MAC address, I could come back in here into DHCP reservations or static IP binding, different routers or call it differently. I can paste that MAC address or pick it. I guess this one gives me a pick from the list. So I can pick it from the list, give it whatever the IP address and add it. And then that is statically assigned. So your device is always on DHCP. You're just reserving that DHP address always for that specific device. That's a little bit more involved than your standard home network stuff, but certainly um, certainly a very viable and usable option. Absolutely. For the sake of this call, I'm just going to leave it on DHP right now. And, and I know that address and I'm just going to go to that, right? So um, now this guy's on Wi-Fi. So now I'm going to disconnect my ethernet essentially. So I'm going to um, just check and I'm 30.110. I'm now going to switch pages. Um, I'm assuming you're still seeing some of this. So I'm on my Unify network. And this is connected to this US8. It happens to be this port seven. Right now it's configured for a network. This is not FEP related at all. This is just, I'm going to change the VLAN on this switch port to be my Christmas VLAN, which is VLAN four. I'm going to apply. Let that go through a provisioning cycle and change that switch. I'm going to come back and do a uh, uh, release my Ethernet adapter. And I'm going to do a renew on my Ethernet adapter. And depending on if my provisioning to the switch finished on time or not, but hopefully I didn't drop you guys. Somebody say something, you're still there? Yeah, I'm here. Awesome, awesome. So my ethernet adapter, this ethernet adapter ethernet is now this 4.159. So it was the 30.110, right? So now basically my computer is representatively connected to the home network, right? So I'm gonna flip back to my other page here. If I go back to this Pi 1 and do like 192.168, except I can't type 30.69. It's just going to time out. I can't communicate to it at all anymore. It's like, it's not reachable, right? These guys are not reachable anymore. But the 4.171 should be, right? So that's the wireless address. So 4.171, so now I'm connected to the 4.171. So I can connect to the wireless side, but not the wired side. So we now have this basic network set up where the FPP Pi is wirelessly connected to my 4 network. My computer is connected to my four network. So I can talk to the wireless side, but it can no longer talk to this wired side or the ETH zero. Right? So in X lights, I got 30.65 is my Falcon. So back in um, 6830, 192.68.30.65. I cannot communicate to the Falcon. You're getting these error and HTTP response because basically it's just not responding, right? So this Falcon and that K8 and the wired side are no longer reachable by my computer because my computer is now separated, right? So now how do I get my X lights on my computer to talk to my controllers and do uplates and everything? So there's right, two quick question. Fire away, yep. Uh, the network switch, does that have to be like a, a special network switch nope so uh, so uh, a 12 dollar trend net five port gigabit switch that you can get on amazon or something will work just fine so it doesn't have to be a managed switch does not be anything just an ethernet switch it's got to be 100 megabit or better the interfaces on the falcons are all 100 megabit your pi is going to depend on what your pi is or what it's got a gigabit or 100 megabit interface but any gigabit low end gigabit switch will work just fine I got an eight port right now, but yeah. I'm looking at upgrading to like either a 12 or 20 or something. Oh, I didn't know if there was like a maximum switch mount or what. No, no, it's whatever switch will work for you, right? So whether you got a 48 port Cisco switch or an eight port, um, I've got like an eight port D-Link switch that's got a web management interface. It's kind of a cool. So it's a managed, it's kind of like a desktop managed switch. It's pretty cheap. And then I've got a couple of like little, like throw in the travel bag, like a little five port plastic switch that I bought off of like micro center or something, right? 
So it does not need to be any kind of special switch, just any kind of network switch that would support the FEP and the controller connections. Yep. And then another question would be is, you know, I'm coming from Lightarama and Lightarama, they don't allow daisy chaining on smart controllers. So Falcons, they have a two ports. How many controllers can you daisy chain off of right. one? So, so Falcons have two ethernet interfaces and they have a built-in two port switch. So if you wanted to go from FPP to one Falcon to a second controller plugging into the Falcon, that's acceptable. Two, maybe hey, three, hey. two, maybe three should be fine. You just don't want to get into where I want to kind of draw real quick, right? So if I got my, you know, FEP device to the first Falcon and I go to a second Falcon, then I go to a third Falcon, these all become like a bus topology, right? So to talk to this third guy, I got to go through the first two to get to the third guy, right? Yep. So that's, that's, that absolutely works, but you don't want to do four, five, six, seven of these, right? You're, you're going to cause yourself some potential headaches and some lags and some delays. Remember, our packets that we're delivering to the Falcon controllers are time sensitive, right? So, you know, if I'm doing a 40 frame per second sequence, that's 25 millisecond timing. So I got to send all of that channel data every 25 milliseconds. So the more that I daisy chain these together, the more potential latency I'm introducing. And these last one on the end of the line might get his data later than the first ones at the beginning of the line. If that kind of makes sense. So by, if you use an actual, so if you had two controllers, that's perfectly fine. Three controllers, absolutely. You can do more, but just you may start introducing some latency and having a little bit of um, delay in what may be perceived as lag. But obviously, if I'm doing a switch, I got my FPP device and I go to a switch and then I connect, you know, controller one, Falcon one, Falcon two, Falcon three. This is more of a star topology and this is just a much more efficient network diagram. But you can absolutely use that second port on the Falcon in this picture that kind of represented right here. And they, they have an integrated two port switch. It doesn't matter which one there's, there's not an in and an out. They're just, it's a two port switch. So you can absolutely ethernet wise daisy chain controllers. Yes. That switch is only a 10 meg switch too. It's a hundred, isn't it? No, it's 10. Okay. That's different than what I was once told, but I I don't use that integrated in there, so I don't really know. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So we're in this configuration now, right? So I'm on the the, the computer and the home network is the four network. The wireless on the FPP is on the four network. The wired's all on the thirty. I can no longer talk to the thirty network. So in order to talk to the controllers and be able to configure them from X sites and everything you need to, there's two things we can do. One and it's written in this bullet point on the left here, we can run what's called proxy mode. So in FPP, it implements an HTTP proxy, or we can manually configure static routing and turn this FPP device into a routing device where I can route between the home computer, route through the FPP to get to the controllers. That's a little bit more involved, a little bit more complex. Some home routers won't support static routes on home routers. And if you set it up on your PC, then it works on your PC. But if you had a second PC, you'd have to set it up on that too. And so doing a, a routed method is going to be um, more complex. We're not going to cover that in great detail today, um, unless we want to at the end. But um, that's why proxy mode exists. So proxy mode implements an HTTP proxy, and we can proxy the HTTP requests through the FPP to talk to the controllers. Not all controllers on the end support proxy mode. Example, some of the older legacy controllers, specifically like the SANS devices controllers, don't fully work in proxy mode. Just because the, the HTTP web engine on that controller is a limited service web engine and doesn't properly support an HTTP proxy. But we're going to configure proxy mode and get these other controllers talking. In, uh, from X sites and uh, be able to open up the controllers in a proxy configuration and be right back to an operational show. So to do that, I'm going to start on the um, Pi site. 
doesn't matter where you start, but we're going to start on the Pi side. So to configure proxy, there's changes on your player. Go back to the network diagram. Right? There's changes on the player, and there's changes in X lights in order to support proxy mode. So on the player, we're going to go to status control, and we're going to go to um, proxy settings. And here's where you're going to add any host that you expect to be proxied or any proxied host. So we're going to add, and we'll put our controller IPs in here, right? So the Falcon was 182.168.30.65, if I remember right. So the Falcon is dot .65 over there on the right, dot .65. I'm going to say add, and I'm going to add the Colp, which is 192.168.30.97. And then we're going to save those. Once they become saved, you'll notice these little links on the right-hand side. So up here in the address bar, you know, normally you have your web address that you're going to and whatever page that you're on, right? So I'm going to click this F16, and if this works correctly, I can now click this link and I'll open my F16 page. And there it is. And if you notice in the address bar, you have the wireless IP of the Pi slash proxy, and then the IP address of the Falcon. So my computer is talking to the Pi through the proxy service to talk to the Falcon controller. See a message in chat. Thanks for the info. I'm out for the night. Yeah, Randy's. Uh, thanks for stopping by. And um, this is being recorded, so it'll be available later. And you know, I know we're going kind of long, but a lot of information, right? So this is a good sign that we're able to talk to the F16 through the Raspberry Pi. Right? I'm going to go back to get back to that Pi, and then I'm going to click the link. Get rid of my chat window. I'm going to click the link for the K8, and the same thing should happen there. It should open up to the K8, this is the K8B, and I'm talking through the wireless side of the Pi, through the proxy service to the IP of the K. So, so from FPP to the controllers using proxy mode is now working fine. Uh, back to my drawing, sorry. So from the FPP to the controllers over proxy mode is working fine, cool. So now we gotta come to the Excites computer down here on the left in order to, um, you guys probably aren't seeing my mouse move when I'm sharing, I don't think, right? Uh, I think. Maybe I have mouse trails I can turn on. I don't know. Anyway, but the x -Lights computer down here on the left will need to now see it. Are oh, you see the mouse? Okay, cool. I wasn't sure. So in order to configure a proxy in x -Lights, we're going to go to the controller and on the right-hand side over in the controller properties. There's a field down here for FPP proxy IP and host name. So this is typically, look at the tooltip. This is typically the Wi-Fi IP of the FPP instance that bridges the two networks. So this is where we put the Wi-Fi address of the Pi. 192, 168, helps if I don't hit the wrong keys. 192, 168, 4.171, hit enter. Remember anytime we edit anything in next lights, we have to hit enter or tab to save the values, right? So, so um, now the proxy is configured for the K8. Now we're gonna go to the F16 and do the same thing. FPP proxy, 192, 168.30.171. And that's saved. We can test real quick by highlighting the controller. Come down here and hit open. And that should launch a browser talking straight to the controller. So from X lights, we're able to open and it talks again through the Wi-Fi proxy IP of the controller. And back to X lights, the F16, open. And it works fine. Ish. I think you set the IP address wrong on that. You did it. Oh, yep, you're right. Look at that. Good catch. So I typed the proxy address wrong. So I'm trying to talk to 3171, which is incorrect. Sometimes I do do things incorrectly just to demonstrate what would happen. That was an accident, not intentional. Teachable moment. Teachable moment. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. So let's set the correct proxy address and then hit open. And it should now come right up to the F16. Cool. So our proxy configuration is now, I wanna close that wrong one there too. I'm gonna to close these other pages because I just don't need them anymore. They're not really talking well, right? So um, 
we can now open. And another thing is once you have a proxy configured, you can also get this open proxy button, which basically just takes you to the web page of the uh, FPP instance that's serving as the proxy. So that's another way to get straight to your primary player. And um, we can, um, one, one, one thing that I'm coming to mind that I didn't cover slightly earlier that I wanted to. So Xlites, FPP controller, Xlites only. When we did our UDP out, set to all when we did our app connect what that effectively did on the player was define our input output channel outputs and it defines this e131 artnet ddp outputs so our player is going to send data out the network this is the network output tab to these devices down below you see the f16 is active and it's talking to 30.65. These are the channels that the F16 needs. The K8 is listed here, but you notice it is not checkmarked as active. That's because he's running as an FPP remote. So, um, and he has his channels and all. So when we did our FPP connect and we set the UDP out column to be all, it defined this page for us. There is no manual configuration on our player to define this. This was done by the FPP connect utility in Xlites. When you set the controller to Xlites only, when you do the FPP connect, this will be not active. If you set the active setting to active, then this will be active, such as the F16. Just an observation moment there. So now we can still go to the player. Now I can talk to the player over the Wi-Fi interface. I can go back to the status page select our butterfly sequence, hit play. And I don't have my camera here real quick, so I'm not sure how my camera's pointing, but as we, uh, there you go. And if I stop now, everything is done. I've hit play, the sequence plays. We're now in proxy mode with a separate wireless network that my laptop today cannot communicate directly to the controllers but I'm communicating to, through the FPP player in proxy mode with a separate show network. Whew. Timing, where are we at? Uh, nine, almost nine o'clock. So just under two hours to get through a whole bunch of great detail. So um, flip back here to and get rid of my chat window that I don't need about some other event going on this weekend. Um, so we went through the online upgrade from four to five using FPPOS method. We went in and talked in detail about setting up FPP as a controller and the Xlites controller properties, specifically that active setting set to Xlites only if you're gonna run in remote mode. We reviewed the FPP connect settings. We talked about multi-sync in the player remote mode and we got that set up. We're having our Raspberry Pi player talking to a Colt K8 player. And we uh, went through and configured a separate show network using proxy mode. I know I said I didn't necessarily expect this to go an hour and a half, but I talk a lot, right? And we did find out. Any outstanding questions or any outstanding areas that we did hit on that anybody might have specific uh, questions over? I see something else in chat. If you're using your KH as a master, how would you set it up in X Lights? Great call, John. Great call. Not too different than what we already are. So, John asks about using K8 as a master. There are different opinions about that. Personally, my preference is to not use a controller device as my player, but certainly possible, right? So in the Xlites configuration would be no real different, right? Because on the controller tab, this is where we're gonna set out the controller part of it and all of its ports and what is directly connected to the K8 and everything. And if he's going to be your player, there's nothing different other than he would be configured in player mode instead of being configured in remote mode, right? So if I go and get rid of, um, let me go back to XLite real quick and do it from here. So let me um, do an open proxy. I wanna minimize my video window again, just so it's out of my real estate space. So this is my um, 
um, Pi Pi, but let's go ahead and open the. Um, uh, yeah, I can do this now. Let's go ahead and open the K8. But all right, so on the status page, when you're in remote mode, it just went back to the actual Pi, not the K8. When you're in, um, oh, I see. When I when I use this shortcut, it goes straight to the pi, not the proxy. So maybe we better use the status page here. Start the proxy. I didn't realize that, but if I if I choose this shortcut, that takes me straight to the pi, not through the proxy interface. I didn't realize that. So status control status page. When you're in remote mode, it's sitting here listening for multi-sync packets, right? So we just change it to player mode. It'll go through and restart the FPP daemon. And this is now in, um, has some goofy artifacts there. So I just refresh the web page. So this is now in player mode. So this is the KAB in player mode. So I can just sit here and say, I want to play that sequence as well. Now you would still configure um, this guy. So if this guy were truly going to be your only player in this show, you'd have to enable his Wi-Fi settings and turn him into this proxy config. So back to the drawing, this FPP device would become the K8, right? So the K8 would be the one that would be in this role connected to the Wi-Fi and serving the proxy mode for your Falcon. And he would be your player. Remember, your player is where your audio is sent also. So you would need to add, because the Colt K8 does not have a sound output device at all. So you would need to ensure you have like a USB Sound Blaster 3, um, like a Sound Blaster Play 3 USB sound card plugged in and in order to get sound output out of it, right? So you would have to have the Ethernet connection for the show network. In this case, it could, because we're running a separate show network in this model we're in right now. Um, and you'd also connect him to the Wi-Fi so he could be that proxy host. You would configure his proxy settings for your Falcon. You would add your sound card. One thing we didn't talk about sound, right? It was status control, FPP settings, audio. So right now this K8B has no sound output device on it at all. So it can't do sound. The Pi, status control, FPP settings, audio has a Sound Blaster 3 plugged into it. But in as far as X sites on the controller settings, you'd still define the controller the same way here. Um, you would not have him set up as a proxy. You would have him on the Wi-Fi side right here if you were doing separate show network because your computer could talk to this controller directly. It does not need to communicate through the proxy if you're using the K8 as a proxy host, then this address would have to be the Wi-Fi side for your computer to talk to, if that makes sense. I think that probably answers the question, John. Let me know if it doesn't. Would you still use FPP push? Yeah, absolutely, yes. Yep, FPP connect. Just, um, you would treat him as the player of course, now that it knows about the four network, you see it's also picking up my Pi Cap, which is my real player, and then Octo Plus, which is um, a two by two LED panel that I got set up. So this is a discovery. Now that my computer is on this four network, it's discovering more FPP devices because I got other FPP devices not in this conversation here. So you would still um, just upload to the K8, and he would be the player. And you want to make sure and push his media. If you wanted to do display testing using all possible models, you would still push the models. And since he would be talking out. So if we're running in proxy mode, good, good, good call. Because you can have a more complex setup is you can have multiple FPP devices running as proxy hosts. So you can have, I'm going to draw real quick. This brings up another good. This is probably more advanced than most of you need to go. But if you had um, like a, a Falcon controller here, you can have an FPP device. I'll call this a C for controller. This will be FPP device. 
you can have another controller with another FPP device. You can have another controller. So this is like a multi-proxy setup, right? So you can get way more complex. This is not necessarily for the faint of heart. And then this is still um, Wi-Fi to the show network. So you have three different proxies that are proxying for three different controllers. And then here you have your computer, right? Your Excite's computer. This is a keyboard kind of, sort of. So um, don't pay attention to my drawing. So your computer could talk to multiple FPP devices and each one having separate controller that it's proxying for. In that case, this FPP device should have the setting for UDP out set to proxied because you only want this guy being configured for the channels going to this controller number one. And then if you had a second device, he would be proxied this device. You only want him configuring channels for this controller number two. That's where you would use proxied if you had multiple proxied um, setup where you're doing this wirelessly different FPP for each controller. Way more advanced of a configuration than typical, but very um, usable. Um, but the K8, you would still do UDP out for the K8 because in this case, if this guy's the player, he's got to send data to the Falcon. So you do UDP out all because you do have a Falcon controller you're trying to send data to in the simple network that we had showcased here, right? Because you got one, pro if you have one proxy host for all of the controllers like this, then you'd still do all in that UDP output. Just if you had multiple FPPs for different controllers, you would, when you do the UDP out proxy. But you still want to push so you can get your media files there. You can get your sequences. So even if you're KH or um, player, you would still do FPP connect in order to send sequences up, whatever sequences you had, and, and also to send your media files so you would have the song files necessary to play. Clear all my drawings, drop my annotation. Any other questions, comments, or otherwise? Nice job, Ron. Oh, you're very welcome. It's a lot of information to go really quick. Thanks for that. And thanks for joining. And if you guys do have, you know, other things as you get forward to building your shows or if you get on your own setup and if questions come up, you know, um, you know, you're always welcome to post in the Heartland mini group for just us local people. If you'd like, you're probably not going to get um, as much or quick of a response there necessarily as some of the other avenues. But again, there is the 24 seven x -Lite Zoom room. Um, I'm in there way too much, but um, plenty enough. And, and there's plenty of people in there that are always willing to uh, step up and lend a hand and answer any questions you might have as you move forward. So Ron, one thing you may be able to, have you played with the API part of things at all? Not enough to, no, yeah. So well, the other reason I was considering it is from a, monitoring temperatures and trying to trend them sure kind of a thing are temperatures available so from fpp you can go to help and then rest api help and this gives you all the different um, api endpoints that are available through the rest API endpoints um are temperatures and stuff available exposed through this i don't know if they are or not i was thinking they were but they may not be. The only what sent me down that path, and somebody can probably correct me, I because I'm only a year into this whole thing, but I was told that my beagle bones can't get below freezing. Um, really? Okay. So I was told hmm. that according to spec, they can't get below freezing. I learned that last year, and so that seemed to be a surprise to many people. So since I have my three culp controllers outside, that becomes a being up here in Iowa in the snow, that becomes a little bit more of something to pay attention to. So I was considering trying to do something that way. I'm extremely confident there's all kinds of beagle bones outside and controllers and- That's kind of what I'm thinking. But... Where they're well below freezing. So I'm not sure. Well, the other thing I is- I would. I feel ahead. that if you always have power running to it, it won't get down below freezing. So my controller boxes stay 30 degrees above ambient temperature. Yeah. 
Because I'm in Iowa too, Troy. Okay. Yeah, the, um, the, the if you do have extreme temperatures, I would, so like we had talked in class, definitely rec recommend like a SanDisk Extreme type of SD card because a lot of SD cards can't tolerate extreme temperatures either, like uh, very low or very hot. Right, so um, there's a series of cards that normally are supported for outdoor and extreme temperature ranges, and the SanDisk Extreme is just an example. One thing, if you do have an issue, you can take like an old C9 bulb and stick in the box too. I've heard a few people up in Canada doing that. I'm relocating so I can actually plug my laptop power in because it's starting to. Those are getting harder to find too, the C9 bulbs. Well, you said C9 bulbs. I'm thinking of something else. The old lamp bulb. I think I'm kind of centered, but like when I'm, I wish you guys could see kind of, Maybe if I change to this view, it looks it looks like my camera went super wide and like I'm only in like half of it, but I think that's I'm not sure what's up with that. I think that's a zoom thing anyway. So um so John, I think you had set recording, right? So I don't know if you wanna I mean I